Okay then, um, thanks for coming along for this demo. Um, I'm going to show you a, a few of the features of Sketchblock. Um, it's gone through quite a few iterations, so I'm going to talk about it in general rather than trying to think about what's new, because um, some of you may not have seen it from at all, so it's um, going to work from that. One of the things, if you've seen it before, brand new icon, which um, Kevin Saunders did for me, and one of the first things I'm going to mention, which is a new feature, is it's now themable. So I'm going to start it up. It's running now with, with the, um, the old theme, which um, uh, Martin Mason created for me with, with the um, AISS icons, plus a few special ones like these selection gadgets. Um, so I'm going to, what I'm going to do is going to convert it to the new theme. So I open up the um, settings and the edit window and promptly find that I haven't got ProAction running. So just fix that. I have installed it. I did install it, where did I put it? Can't see this thing. Let's try that again. Ah, oh, this is not good. This is all set up. Okay, now it should be working. There's another quick demo of Tony's fabulous shell there for you. <laughs> okay, yeah, right, go into the settings menu, which comes up nicely. Um, there's a new, a new entry, theme name. Um, I'm going to change from the AISS theme to the KS theme but for Kevin Saunders. I think that's spelled right. I can't quite see the text. Save the preferences does require a restart, so I stop the program, start again. Uh, that didn't work. Settings, edit. Uh, didn't, didn't save. What's going on? It's all work when I practice at home. <laughs> press enter. Some of these gadgets you need to press enter in sometimes, and it's always not always obvious. Um, yeah, right, now you can see it's a new theme because, um, because the logo is different and some of the gadgets have changed. Um, but the themes that I've provided, these two themes, they come in two parts because um, in order to get um, the change of tick marks and such like, you need um, a separate graphics press. So what I'm going to do now is stop again and open up screens press. Uh, and I'm going to enable the um, sketchbook print window that I've got waiting. And then use a custom um, GUI press, which now um, 
we go to um, the sketch path, the sign. This is a little fiddly and technical, but I don't think there's any easy way to, um, to, to automate this section at the, at the moment. Um, um, no, because I'm not running the program. God. Can't get this staff, can you? Right. Now it's assigned. Themes, and then choose the go into the KS presets, choose the GI prefs, then go into the palette, choose a custom, choose custom file, and same again, go to sketch path, Themes, KS, preset. And palette press. Right, and then save that. Now, I'm going to restart. Switch block will open on its own. Well, it won't. Why oh, didn't it do that? Does that say sketch block there? <laughs> Should do. Yep. Ah, screen mode, yep. Got to set up screen mode for it. That's, that stays set up on my own machine, strangely. So, um, so we apply that as default and save that. Now when I start sketch block, it starts on its own screen. And it's using the new color scheme and also the new gadgets styles so you can get you can only use the full theme on your own screen unless you choose to change the um the workbench theme to that scheme if you like it enough but um it's just designed for sketchbot really so so we're into the main program um the default layout is still set up for a um 1 to 80 screen so the first thing i ever do is now is move that over here and drag this out to full size it's a bit tricky on the edge of the palette there Pull up the project. Now, big contribution from Kevin Saunders. There's a hundred new brushes, just the same as he did for the P paint. But this must have taken a lot more work because these are a lot bigger. Um, there's a hundred different themed brushes. Um, they're quite big brushes. Um, but they've got a range of different effects, different sizes and shapes, and something's going wrong there. So, oh, the colour's on, I clicked a colour. Yeah, it's a nice effect, but um, uh, I was going to demonstrate that later, so I'm confusing myself. <laughs> so as you can see, there's some great brushes here. This is a, a fractal, um, kind of spiral fractal thing. Um, um, so let's change the colour so you can see the contrast. So there's some pretty cool brushes. Um, they're all a little big. Um, on, a, on an X1000, they flow quite well, but on a, on a slightly lighter machine, they may be a, bit, a little slow. But you can um, use the brush presets to set them to a smaller size, so scale them down to say 50%. Um, so now it renders a slightly smoother, and then at 50%, they, they, there's no lag at all now. Go straight across and draw in freehand. Um, and Sketchblock is designed for freehand drawing, so the most optimized part of the program is, is, is being able to draw freehand without. So that brush draw is always in sync with the mouse, because otherwise it drives you mad. Anybody who knows who's done drawing in a uh, program knows if, if you start there and, the, and it catches up a minute later, then you just give up. Um, so 
fantastic selection of new brushes, which is one of the major contributions to 2.7, which is going into the Radiance package and also as a standalone. Um, so features, what we can, what can we do is it's a layers based program. So we've got all this on one layer. We can add a new layer, which uh, default is white, so it overwrites. Um, so we can now draw something else. Let's switch back to a smaller brush, just um, for sketch. Now layers um, are, are blended together um, by a number of different rules. Um, by standard is your simple opacity, so you can just turn down, so you can see the layer below it through it, obviously. Um, but also there's um, a whole set of um, multiply, so it interacts, it multiplies the colours together. Um, you've got divide, so. Um, uh, these are a lot. These are fairly standard modes, so you can get different effects. So add works well, like a um, almost like a palette, and you can use it to uh, what you call it. Um, you can see that, yeah. Um, in this context, I'm subtract. So depending on the different colours you've got, you can get some pretty amazing effects just by doing this, and then work paints through. And of course, you can use the opacity to vary the amount of that as well. You get um, quite interesting combinations. It depends on what you want to do, um, but the most common two I use is the simple normal alpha blend and the multiply, because. Um, uh, uh, but you've also got saturation. You can turn things black and white, except for where you draw, or or the other way around, depending on the color scheme. If, you, if you're drawing in black. Where it's white, it desaturates. Where it's coloured, it goes to the, um, the level of saturation of the colour you're painting in. So you can, um, these are probably quite complicated terms for beginners, but um, when you play around them for a while, um, you get um, interesting effects. So this one darkens, burns. Layers can, let's go back to the normal. So that's a normal solid layer. You can also um, have alpha blending on the layers. So I can add an alpha channel, which just adding the alpha channel, um, which shows up here now as an icon, now, now shows that you have alpha. The, the little X disappears. It's hard to see. There's, there's an X saying there's no alpha there. There's no, there's no X, so you have an alpha channel on this, on this one. So you can erase the alpha channel, just simply rub it away so you can see what's below it. Or you can add, use one of these functions, add, turn the colour to alpha. So this will turn the background colour, which is white, to transparent. So now you can see fruit. And then, of course, you can paint into that over the top. And then if I move that layer around, you can see that the two are independent. Which, um, which this is, I mean, the a lot of the Amiga programs don't use layers. I think one or two of them do. Um, like, I should imagine, um, what is it? Not Photoshop, what's it? Photo, photo, there's one beginning with P. Was. Uh, there's a couple that use layers, but I haven't found anything that worked as well as this. Yeah, yeah? okay, that's cool. <laughs> they use them in different ways. Yeah, I can't, I can't remember the names of the other programs, but some. Um, yeah, that's the one. Yes, actually, ImageFX does use layers, but it's, very, it's a very different way of doing it. Um, one, one feature that in Sketchblock, which I think is pretty unique, is the way the undo works. Um, normally, uh, in a paint program, you undo step by step. So if you add something to one layer, and then you add another something to another layer, and then you want to undo what you added to the first layer, you have to undo the subsequent steps. Um, and I found a few times that I'd drawn exactly what I want in, in one place, um, changed, changed it, drawn something else on another layer, realized that I wanted to go back to the first thing on the first layer, and you have to undo the whole lot and then go back again. So, so now, undoing works on a per layer basis. So um, you click that, it undoes all the movements, and that's all you but um, then if I change back to this there, I can undo the last thing I did to that there, independently. Uh, or we can redo it again. 
And I find so, I find that gives a lot more flexibility in um, how you handle um, sort of non-destructive editing. You can do a whole lot of work on one one layer, switch to another layer, do a load of work, and you can undo the previous work if you decide it doesn't quite fit together. Um, up at the top here is a master undo, and this. Um, works through the different undo steps in order. So if you want just to undo it in the normal way, um, step by step, you can. And this also group certain scripts group small steps of undo together. So if you do a scale operation, that might shrink the window and then move it to a different position, which will be two steps on uh, at the program level. Uh, and the master undo will undo that whole grouped operation, or you can undo sections of it on the sub sub levels on the there's a project level undo layer and an individual undo for each layer and some hidden ones that I thought I decided were too complicated for putting into the GUI for normal users so to speak but can be accessed from the Arex interface. So um, it's getting a bit messy now so let's get rid of some these some um, the new icons I think uh, I've had a few complaints um, maybe it's too strong some feedback that um, it's hard to work out what these icons do in the AISS version because they're very, very, very similar. So Kevin tried to make them very distinct. So we got add new layer, um, move the current layer to the background. I think that's the reason. So move it down to the bottom. So I was already in the background, right? Let's do it the other way around. So moves it down to the bottom. Um, didn't seem to make any change actually. Never mind. Um, Oh no, that was copy layer, sorry. I'm losing the plot here a little bit. The trouble is they're, they're much more distinct when you've got a focused screen, but when you're at the other end of the room and you can't even see where they are. <laughs> right, so that one copies the layer. Um, that one moves the current layer to the top. That one moves the current layer to the bottom. And that one mer merges the two current layers together. So um, current layer merges the current layer with the one below it. So if I come to this one here, now this one will get merged into that one. Um, so, and this one uh, deletes the layer completely. So I go to the bottom one, I can delete that one. And that arm. Can you resize the layer areas? Can I? The layer area, make, give you more room. Calm. Um, is you resize the GUI? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was so busy showing off the, um, yeah, you can drag that up and down in the middle. Um, you obviously a little preview in the layer. That can't be set at the moment. I'm thinking of maybe making that one um, an option so the size of that can be reduced or even removed if you don't want to put it. And then you'll be able to see a lot more layer information if you need it. Uh, this icon turns the layer on and off so you can see it or not. So anyway, let's get rid of these layers and start from scratch. Um, right, some other functions. Um, as well as freehand drawing, um, we support text um, and vector paths, which are text is converted into paths, so it's a very similar aspect. So um, if you go to the layers menu and can't see create text option. Uh, got a little ProAction GUI comes up, so it's a this is a script running with my ProAction server, and the you normal user didn't need to know that, but um, just for the technical aspect, it kind of runs. It's basically an Arrow script creates a, creates a GUI, and you can um, do all sorts of things from it. This one creates text, so we've got text in the middle there. Um, using the text gadget, you can put whatever you like. Set the justification. Um, Get into that, type in some text. Um, got some controls, the height and the baseline. The height um, defines the, the height of the text, which we probably make down about 50. And the baseline is the separation of the lines, basically. Um, 
and you can choose a font and basically you directly choose uh, any, any true type or postscript font. Um, I think there may be a few other types, but mainly it's true type or postscript is the ones we have available. And it's using um, pre type to load the, load the fonts. But there's none of this um, font, config, com, font config stuff, other program stuff, or from uh, you just use them directly. So I choose uh, what I've got there. There's not a lot on this, this particular program, so it's fairly boring. So I just choose a Vera font. I've got and then uh, make text and creates smooth anti-alias text which you can move around. You can't edit edit the text. <laughs> you can see my typo skills coming out there. Now that I can obviously actually see what I typed. <laughs> um, so that's not editable unfortunately at the moment but um, but the GUI does store what you last did. So if I bring it up um, create text again the last, the last set of options you have are in, are in there, so you can go in and fix some of those typos. Yeah, everything should be safe, so we make that a little bit bigger. Not at the moment, but that's not impossible. Um, that would be slow, though, because um, I'd have to be accessing all those t true type fonts with font with free type and rendering them off and stuff. So um, you might wish I didn't by the time you. <laughs> it, it probably makes more sense to do that because the OS guys are really hash. Yeah, um, I'm not using the OS to load the fonts because I need. Um, the, the, a, the OS API doesn't give you access to the actual metrics of the font. Um, it will render the font for you, but I need it, um, the actual positions of the dots and the vectors and such like, because um, what this does is it creates um, a path from the fonts. And I'll, I'll, do, I'll do a quick demonstration of the paths in a minute, but, um, which is why you get such smooth anti-aliasing, which you can't see so well. Um, On this, but if I if I zoom in, maybe it might show up a little bit better. Is this, the resolution of the screen is a little bit um, fuzzy. Now this, I don't know if you've used Sketchlock before, but you might notice that the scrolling is now dead smooth. Um, up until last week, it was absolutely abysmal, uh, almost an embarrassment to be honest, because I had to render everything on the screen for every little touch. But I've now I've done a proper. Um, damage areas and such like, so I only really render the edges as I scroll and use scroll raster to properly do it, do it the proper Amiga way. So, so coming back onto the topic, you can see that you've got very good smooth anti-aliasing on that text. I don't think you can get much better um, unless you make it a bit softer perhaps, I don't know, but that's, I like that, it's pretty good. So you can put pretty much arbitrary text in there. Um, Editable text is um, on the to-do to list. So um, I zoomed it from the zoom gadget at the bottom there, but you can also um, use the shortcut in the menu. Uh, zoom, and there's a fit to window option, which is the fastest way to get back to normal. Um, a little trick that I use actually when I'm using a stylus, which I'm doing at the moment, it, it's really hard to access the right mouse button. So I simply use the right and Minga alt combination to bring up menus uh, with, with my left hand whilst working with the first right hand. So it can be sketching away like this there and then bring up the menu when I need it um, to bring up, say, the image resize, which has got um, simply half the size of the image. That will now, that, that's an example of the, um, the composite undo that I was talking about. That was done in a set of set separate operations, which you could use the master undo to undo the whole lot. Or you can undo it on a per layer basis. Well, that, that was a project resize or, the le or one operation per option. Should you have a need just to, just to undo one section of it. So 
it's a complicated concept to get your head around, but I think it's really powerful once you know how to use it. Right, that's text. Uh, another thing I was going to show is um, is path, path. So I'm going to load in um, a new project. What I'm doing here is I'm going to directly import um, a reference image from the net. So sketchbook demo references. So now, zoom it to fit the window. Ah, oh, this is a nice lizard image, image I found. Now I'm going to load in a work in progress because this takes quite a while to do. Um, so I load in a path. Well, a path is basically a collection of sp of splines, which are curves and points, and can also have um, simple polygons as well. Um, I'm going to add some more different types of sub-elements to that over time. But um, uh, I think that's the right one. Does that come up? Right, so I loaded the path. Um, this area of the GUI needs a little bit of um, tweaking because you can't actually see that you've loaded anything there. But if I go into Edit Path, uh, it will now come to active, and you can see all the points um, on around the out, outline of of the lizard. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit now. So. Um, because I zoomed in, and I, as I say, the GUI needs some work, uh, they've been overwritten. So a little trick there, when that happens, if you find they disappear, just call the edit path um, script again, and they reappear. So as you can see there's a control point there. This is going to be a bit tricky, because I can't see that. Right, I selected it, and you can drag it around. So what I'm doing with this project is gradually creating an outline. I've got down to here somewhere, I can't quite see. Um, yes, I'm going to use that edit path trick again because I really can't see what's going on there. Okay, so you can create outlines. So to create a new path, you press shift and control. That's a new, a new path, and there's a dot there. Now, to create a new dot on that, you press. Con um, I'm clicking with the um, with the stylus and pressing the control key, and then another one, and then you can move backwards with the keyboard, um, and then convert that point there into into a control point rather than rather than a point. So that points an outline there, and then I can move to the next toe and create another path, add another line. Um, same again. So, so you can um, build up a little outline as you go of the. Um, oops. So I now need to delete that path. You press delete, which is really easily. I've done it again. Press shift and then. So I think this is a neat little feature that you can build, gradually build up. So now if I'm going to add another layer now in plain white over the top, and now what I can do is go to the path menu again and stroke the path with the current brush. And you've instantly got an outlined picture. Um, you can save that path out and you can use it to um, create vector graphics from it. Now it's, this is um, it's a set of tools for somebody who's got an interest to build something more. Somebody's asking me about CAD the other day, which I think is a bit ambitious. But you could use this, this set of tools, if you're an Arix programmer, to write a CAD program running in Sketchblock. And one of the principles of Sketchblock is that it's, um, it's an API for painting with. Um, you don't have to use the GUI that I've designed for it. If you have the skills, you can write your own plugins in, in Python and Arix. Um, to do more advanced things.
Um, so now we can we could make this one transparent so it overlays the original, and you see, it's a good map. Yeah. It's one path. Um, for within the sketch on def definition, a, p a path is a collection of splines, so or objects and points. So they're all <coughs> they're all grouped into one one big path. And, and when you were drawing the points, uh, some of those lines are some of them are connected to the same spline. Yeah. Some are. What was the switch between the connected and unconnected? Um, to create a new a new spline, you press Shift and Control. Create a new point. You press, just press Control. Yeah. And uh, any point that you add will be added to the current active spline. That's it. Yeah. There's there is some there is some documentation on the website about this, but um. Yeah, but you're here. Yeah. <laughs> but you're not going to remember when you go home in a minute or when a couple of days done. Yeah. So. And there are a few other tools like left and right mouse moves backwards and forwards within the path. Um, And then just clicking, near the nearest point will be selected. Or if you shift click, the nearest path um, curve will be selected. I don't know if you can see that on here because of the colours are hard to see. The selected one turns um, turns red, but I'm not sure if you can really see the difference in colour between red and black. I mean, that's black, that's red. Doesn't show up very well on this screen. No, paths, paths are global to the project. Uh, you can load as many as you like, but there's no real way, way to see what's loaded at the moment. This is one of the areas I, I need to expand. I mean, there's, there's a lot in Sketchbot, but there's a lot to do yet. And um, I'm going to put a lot of work into uh, the 3.0 version, which will be coming out when it comes out. Um, Sketchblock is a high dynamic range program. So that means um, rather than 32 bits per image, You've got a whole floating point value for each, each color channel, red, green, blue, alpha, which gives you amazing flexibility for shading and such like. But it means it uses a lot of memory. And all some people want to do is scale an image. So the next generation of Sketchblock will give you the choice. Um, the first generation used 32. Then I thought I'm, I'm upgrading to, to high dynamic range. Now I'm going to upgrade to choice. I think the choice is good. So if, if you just want big, uh, not too worried about sub detail, then you can use 32 bit. If you want really fine shading, um, then you can choose to use the high dynamic range. And if I can get it to work, uh, you'll even be able to have combinations within one, one project. That just depends on how they interact, um, how much that might slow things down if I have to do too much conversion. So, so one, one comment on the HDR piece. I think there's an HDR format. I don't know how common that is. So uh, well, I, ha I have built all the, um, the support libraries for the EXR format as part of Blender. Um, so I will, I will work on a way to import that data because there's no way at the moment to save the HDR data apart from a native Sketchblock file, uh, which is great for Sketchblock. If you, wanna, if you actually want to port out and export an HDR image, then, um, then I need to build an exporter for that. Um, but, but I have already got all that stuff as part of the Blender port. So I need to work out how to in build a plugin that doesn't mess up the GPL status of my app, which isn't, and that is. So you know what it gets like with mixing. Might have to get somebody else to write it for me. Data types wouldn't be able to handle the data once you've loaded it. There's, there's Unless you, you don't, a picture data type couldn't deal with a, uh, HD at the moment. We'd have to rewrite the picture data type for that. I, see. Okay. I don't fancy doing that. So it would require like a standalone viewer to then view the. Yeah, there is one on OS4 Depot actually. Okay. Um, if you want to check that out, I ported that a long time ago. It's, I think it's called EXR View or something like that. So if, if people are creating work with Sketchblock and they want to show it on their Amiga, they would use that viewer to, to then open those files using if they're using the high dynamic range. Yeah. Uh, once, once I've written an, a tool for export, maybe I might have a look at that tool and see if I can um, uh, find a way to import sketch block images into that direct. I haven't really thought of that, but that's, that could be another sub-project. Um, 
Right, what have I covered? S text, paths, layers. Can I, I'll just take questions and see if anybody wants... Uh, yes, in a sense you can, in so far as it's got PostScript print support. So you can print to PostScript and set up as a page. You can set, uh, print to EPS, so the whole image goes out as an EPS file, or you can print to PDF. Again, you have to set up the page. Um, let's see if I can... Uh, hang on. Uh, I need to get... No, it's not ProAction, this one. Oh, the PostScript. Yeah, I just need to get rid of that because there's no PostScript device on this. And I just want to save to RAM. So, let's see if I can demonstrate this. Oh, I got... What's going on here? Can't see the cursor. Right. So if I, if this has been worked properly, that should be printing to PDF now. And that prints the all layers that are visible. What does it print? What does it actually print? It prints what you can see on the screen. Uh, in that mode, I think you. Yeah. So right, I should in the RAM disk now have a PDF, which should load up. And there you go. So you could create that PDF from your from your image and take it down the printers, or or print it using whatever technique you can use. Print it, print PDFs like GoScript or, or whatever. But I I don't directly support printer device because um, that's you throw most of your image college away when you do that anyway. So you might as well use um, existing support. Yeah, <laughs> if, if the, it's dri it is driven by my needs, basically. If I find something I can't do, I implement it. Um, if people ask me for features and they're, and they're reasonable, I do that too, but I don't know what people, other people need until they ask me for it. So if you've got a feature, in, if you use Sketchblock and you need something, tell me and it will go on the to-do list. And can't guarantee it will be done tomorrow, um, but if it's a simple one, I'll do it quickly. If it's not, um, well, I keep it all in mind. All I can really show is how it how it affects the smoothness of um, of scale of um, fill. If I show you the um, the gradient fill, and let's put an alternative colour in there, and apply that gradient, you get a really smooth colour gradient there. Um, in 32 bit. You'd, you'd get bands in on that, even on 32. 16 bit type images, you get lows, but I thought. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> See, I mean, that's a pretty smooth gradient. Um, in terms of. Because a lot of people associate high dynamic, high dynamic range with the compressed images that you see. Um, you can't really do that yet with this. You need to actually build that up yourself. There isn't, doesn't, I haven't got any compression tools yet. That's something I might look at creating. Because I know there's, there's, there's some interest in that. Because um, I know you asked about it, didn't you? And um, about porting a set of tools. Was it you that asked about that? Which one? You asked about porting a set of... Um, um, dyna high dynamic range compression tools of some kind. I can't remember. And I, bla I, I bragged that you can do that already in Sketchblock, but but it's not quite true because you have to you have to do it yourself by hand. Yeah, there's a Q, there's a uh, QT project called Luminant HDR. Yeah. And it's for taking multiple regular photographs and squashing them into uh, an HDR yeah. image. And then you told me that I could do it in Sketchblock. You can. So I took if I, ha I haven't got a sample of um, images at different um, so things to show, it, but what you can do is build up four or five layers and, and then change the way those layers are mixed together to get that effect. You definitely can do that uh, using the multiply effect and opacity and such like. Uh, 
you can save that whole project as a whole thing from the save option. Uh, just, and I normally put them in sketches and just save. Or I'm not going to do save that one now. Uh, or you can use export, in which case, hang on. Export as, which should bring up another little um, GUI, and you can select the format JPEG, say, export to RAM. No, um, imp import files are, are data types based. Uh, exporting is, is handled by um, uh, PIL, which is the Python Imaging Library. Um, so all the data types that Python Imaging Library can load, you can load, or can save, you can um, save via, um, via the script, which is a, a few really weird ones. Um, which are suitable for geographic satellite analy analysis and, and a couple of useful ones like JPEG, Ping and, um, and TIFF and such like. Um, I think one of the projects I'm going to work on for the 3.0 version will be dedicated um, loader and saver modules because um, PIL is useful but it is a little slow and I think having, and you don't get so many access options to have a, a JPEG saver where you can set the percentage quality and all that kind of thing would be very useful. At the moment, it just saves as much. In order not to lose any quality, it saves maximum quality. If you want to shrink that, then you'd have to load it into image effects, perhaps, and fiddle with the, with the um, compression qualities and such like. Any more questions? I yep. think, um, selection tools. Um, oh, yeah, OK, yeah. Got a bunch of those. Bunch. A load of those. Okay, right, this row here, uh, I can't quite see that properly. Right, you've got four tools. Um, rectangle select, which you just grab that, press the space bar, and that selects a rectangle. This is a bit that quite a few people miss. Um, when you, with this rectangle and ellipse tool, you have to press the space bar to make the selection good. Moving the, um, the guide around just chooses a different position, but you don't change the selection until you press that space bar. Um, so that's been confusing a few people. I can't find any easy way of, apart from maybe right clicking, but that's a really awkward with the um, stylus, uh, other than actually having a, a separate key action to do that. So the, the concept is preview and commit? Yeah, basically. And now you've got a set of um, options. You've got the replace option, add option. So if you add and then you move up there, and then you grab again, that adds the two selections together. Um, you've got the subtract option, which is already on. So that now that selects that. So you've got an area selected. You can do the same thing with the ellipse tool. Let's say um, subtract a little bit of ellipse there. So what the, what the selection tools do, um, a lot of people think of them as copy and paste, but it's not really about that. It's, it's a, a mask. It's a painting mask. So operations now, when you grab a brush and choose a complementary color so you can see it, you just and paint into that layer. They only occur inside that selected area. Let's get a size and on there. So as you can see it's like that's not can the you best. Convert the to a path? Can you convert selection to a path? Um, yes, there is an experimental function hidden in the Arix interface to do that, but it doesn't work very well. It's incredibly, di I mean, that is really easy. That's a square, square lines, really easy to work out where the corners are, and you get a, you'll get a square path from that. But if you were to do, use this function, which is the flood select, uh, let's turn that back to replace, 
and try and focus it at that eye. And so that went a bit odd, but... Um, I think it's because you have that gradient built over the uh, Yeah, of course, yeah. We, we can't really see it, but the select tool can see it. So let's get rid of that, yeah. Go into the original thing. So I try selecting the eye there, so or I need to make the color sensitivity a bit less. So let's try and select his nose. Okay, so because it's a photograph, this kind of thing doesn't work as well as in photographs as it can do. All right, so you, right. Now imagine trying to make a path out of that with, with, with code, with, by hand, let alone with code, is a headache. Um, the, I haven't actually read the code in GIMP, I just looked at the size of the file and thought, right. Because <laughs> I don't want to read GIMP's code too closely because that um, it contaminates, doesn't it? But, um, so it, there is an algorithm to do what you asked for, but it's really bad at doing it. Um, you, having said it's not about co copy and paste, that there is a script to enable you to, to um, copy the selection which um, uses some sub-layers sub and things. Now, if that works right, I should have the um, selection in the, key, in the um, clipboard, and I should be able to paste that into a new layer. So there's a new layer now. Um, up the top, let's turn the old ones off. So, so what, did you, what does the copy do? It's just the selection? Yeah. No, you can't. You can't pick pick up stuff now. You can just um, copy data out. Can't even. See. Oh, it's up the top there. There it is. There's the um, the set of images that I just copied out of that layer. So that that, that operation cut the image data. Yeah. And turned it into another layer. That's. Uh, yeah. Image. Turns it into an, turns it into another layer, and and which you can then position where you can move that around position where you want. That's, that's a bit of a pale example, unfortunately. But, uh, but that is now actually in the um, system clipboard. So if I, um, if I get, uh, let's find a, I just, no. Uh, where's my original? Oh, there it is. If I bring up my selection and then I do a control C to a control V to put the clipboard in. Uh, oh, it's even still pale on there, but you can see at the top there, there's the image in the system clipboard. So you can share that image um, with, uh, with uh, other um, brain systems. So let's get this back over here. If you were to paste that into an app that had alpha channel support with, it, with the alpha channel. Yeah, it would be, yeah. Let's just do this again with a slightly more obvious... Um, Paint tool in first. Which, which layer am I here? Let's get that one visible. Turn that one off. Things are bouncing around a little bit here. So if I, if I paint into that layer, should be painting. Can't see. Uh, I think this is a bit pretty. Um, oh no, the selection's still on. Right. Oh yeah. If you need to clear the selection for some reason. Um, you can just quit to clear and it should go away. Clear selection. So now the selection's gone, so you can draw again. Hello, or not, as the case may be. So, uh, okay, I really can't see what's going on in this at the moment, to be honest. It's just <laughs> it's too blurry on the screen level. Oh, it is painting, it's just that really soft brush. Let's get that one back. Um, I'll have to turn the alpha, the alpha channel down. Right, okay. <laughs> Still, and I've got colours the wrong way around. So here we go. Right, now, and I'll do a colour select on that one, or flood select, right? This will be a lot more obvious. Now I can copy that into the clipboard. Copy selection. Let's turn this layer off. So you can, oh, that layer off, rather. Now, if I paste that, you'll be it'll be a lot more obvious. 
that has happened. So you can see the, the selected area with the alpha channel it has, has been saved. And um, again, if I um, show you there and do a control V, it's in, it's in the system clipboard with alpha channel. So if Okay, um, keyboard equivalents, um, firstly the way to find out what they are uh, is to go to settings, edit and choose keys. So there's a whole list. Now that's a little bit cryptic because it's the list um, of keys and the list of commands associated with the keys rather than the name. But, uh, you edit yeah, that's editable. So the standard ones I've got at the moment are P for paint. E for erase, S to swap the colours, um, that swaps these two colours backwards and forwards. Um, control, control Z is a global undo, Control Y is a global redo. Um, Omega Z and, and Omega Y also work, I believe, but um, con Control Z is very convenient when you're painting one handed. Um, I think. Uh, so, and there's a few others there, so I'll just show you by hand the ones I can remember. So, P is paint. Let's clear this out and get a new, new layer. So, and then clear the, clear the selection. Right, P is paint. E is erase. All right, this is a subtlety of arrays. When, when there's no alpha channel, arrays replaces the foreground with the background. When there's an alpha channel, it erases it completely. So if I put an alpha channel on that layer, add alpha, now you're erasing. So as I said, P is paint, E arrays. C uses the new, new color picker tool. There's always been a color picker tool in um, Sketchblock. Um, but you press the control to activate it. This, this brings up a more complex tool um, where you can do um, averaging picking. So you can pick the average between those, those at that point uh, over about four or five pixels. You can make it a bit bigger and then pick this point there. And you'll get, if you pick a bit closer, you'll get the pink. Uh, or you can do the exact pic pixel that you click on, which is hard to show from here. So red or purple. Um, and you can also pick the alpha channel, which is occasionally useful. Um, so now you can paint, you can actually paint with zero alpha, which is absolutely useless, but, you <laughs> but if you can get it somewhere in between, you can get, um, you can paint with alpha, which is, which is a, which is a feature which is occasionally useful, but it's a little bit tricky to set up when I can't see what I'm doing. So there's a more advanced, this is another new feature, it's a much more advanced colour picking tool. But the old colour picking tool, which people miss, uh, is still in. So you press um, control and you see the, um, mouse the mouse image changes to a dropper. And you just pick up the individual pixels like that. Uh, there's, a, there's a few more things I could talk about, but I've been talking for quite a while now. So are there any more questions before I, before I wind up? Freehand, can you freehand select? No, not at the moment, no. Um, yeah, you could, you could do a, you, you could simulate that by creating a layer over the top and then painting the area you wanted to select and then selecting that. Um, but, but there isn't a direct freehand selection tool at the moment. No, no. The redo would save the actual um, change, and if you read uh, the undo would save the change. If you redo it, um, it will do it exactly as you did it before. Otherwise, so it's, it's saving the bitmap data that's changed, not the actual effect. It would, yeah. What's your point? Well, it's a color overlay mode, maybe. Uh. Oh yeah, there is a color oh, mode. So you, yeah, you could change the color that way. So yeah. If you, wanted, if you wanted, if it was red and you wanted it the exact same thing to be blue, you could overlay it with a color. Yeah. Sorry.
You'd have to, you'd have to draw it again if you want to if you want to change it on that level. Any other questions? How much does the undo actually undo? For instance, if you were using the pressure sensitive uh, trick with the pen yeah. and scrolling across the screen, so you had uh, harder, 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 harder up the screen. Yeah. If you press undo, does it, does it undo the, the whole thing yeah. or, or just the last uh, step of the... It undoes the last, it, an individual undo action undoes the last stroke, so, um, on the paint tool. So, it undoes from the moment you put the paint tool down to the moment you lift it up. Yeah, including the whole range of pressures. Yeah. Um, it doesn't make a note of those pressures, it only, it, what it undoes is the change to the image. Yes. Yeah. Um, and in terms of the number of undo steps, it's unlimited and, um, apart from available memory. Uh, and you can set a limit on how much memory to use because um, on a long project to work you could actually build up quite a stack of them um, and after a while you, you don't really want to undo the first couple of steps. Um, but in principle if you set that limit to zero so it's infinite you could, you could start at the very beginning and redo the whole lot from scratch. And if you're in the long session you could purge some of your uh, undo buffers? Yeah. If so, say again? If you're working all day on the one project yeah. and, and you start to run out of memory, are you able to go back and, and release some of your old undo buffers? Or does that happen automatically? That happens automatically, okay. yeah. Yeah, um, um, yeah as, as it hits the memory, the, the la the, it's the first in, for last, last in, first out kind of... What was it? No, it's first in, first out, yeah. So the last thing, the first thing you undid disappears and then the next one up, up through the thing. Um, there is another, another feature that's hidden in there. You can actually record macros. Um, so you can record every event that occurs and, and in combination with ProAction scripting, that's got macro recording as well. You can end up recording the, G, the GUI um, um, actions as well. So you can see what you did. If you need to de debug something and trying to work out why that went wrong, you can actually set it up so that um, uh, actually every single fi action that happens, or very nearly every single action that happens, can be redone. Or you can, or you can simply use it to create macros. If you draw a shape, um, then you can save the file, create an Arrow script from that file to, re able to be able to redraw that shape on demand. And the macros can be either it will either create macro, Arix macros or Python macros, depending on the settings. Mm. Okay, well, thanks for, thanks for listening. I hope that was interesting. I know it was a little bit random and technical in places, but um, this is quite a complicated thing to try and explain. Do, thank you. Do give me feedback, features, or suggestions by email, or just ask me on IRC what, if you get into trouble, as some of you already do. Yeah. <laughs> or vector select would be cool too. So. Um, yeah, selection from path.